Hitler uses his gun, but he does not use his voice in some way. Uh, is that gas from 36? You can probably throw some barrels. Oh no, I don't. All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, get started with today's class. Um, I guess you know, there will be a few more people to join us. Two are over at on the YouTube side, so we got about um, eight people, you know, participating in the synchronous session today, at least right now. All right, so I am hoping that all of you got a chance to get started with um, the the lab slash homework assignment from last time, um, and I hope you guys are making some progress with that. Because what we are, what I'm doing today is I am releasing the other version of the homework assignment. You can work on both simultaneously, or you can work on one at a time. That's entirely up to you. Uh, so the other one is right here. It is a positive exponent. Uh, basically the same deal, but this time we have a, a positive exponent of 10 to begin with. And the objective is to get it down to zero. Okay, so that's what we will be talking about at the beginning of this lecture. And then I am hoping that we'll have time to get started with von Neumann's architecture, because that is where what the um, the row taking password is based on. So I certainly hope that we can get to the flip flop and other basic memory devices. So without any additional so let me see if there are any questions. I'm looking at the uh, Discord channel, in the text channel, and there's nothing here. So I'm assuming there are no questions. And I hope, I'm hope i hoping people are at least getting started with the assignment because, uh, I mean, it's not really a difficult homework assignment, but with any type of programming assignment, uh, the amount of time to do something is sometimes unpredictable. So getting started earlier is usually a good approach. All right, so if there are no further questions, I am going to get started to talk about uh, the positive exponent thing, okay? So let me just kind of recap what V or the value is, okay? V is representing the value um, represented by a uh, base 2 scientific notation, which is kind of hybrid as sometimes, okay? So we got a few components. We got M, which is the mantissa, and then we got M... 10 to the power of oops 10 to the power of e10 so e10 is the exponent of 10 otherwise known as exp10 you know as the as the name of the member of the structure that you are given with um well okay pn is the name of the parameter in the program but what PN points to is a structure, and inside that structure is a member called EXP10. So EXP10 is basically the same thing as E10 in this notation. Oops. Uh, and then we have uh, times again, uh, 2 to the power of E2. So E2 is basically EXP2 in, as a member in the, in the structure. So this is the value that is, uh oh, uh, I forgot to put 10 in curly braces, and I thought I did. Hmm. E, oh, okay, I see, E underscore T, there we go. Um, it is still not liking it. Okay, I'm missing something. Oh, I'm missing a close param here, or close brace, there we go. So this is you know, uh, what we had last time, and we continue to work with this equation. The value is the mantissa. Now, the mantissa is basically a 64-bit unsigned integer in this case, which is technically not, cannot be called the mantissa, but I'm just calling it the mantissa here. And then times 10 to the power of e10 times 2 to the power of e2. 
So E2 initially is a zero, okay? And then E10 in this discussion is initially a, a positive integer, meaning it is at least one. And then M is the mantissa and it is, um, well, it can change. So what we want to do is to preserve V while changing E10 to zero eventually. Okay, so that's what we want to do. All right, so let me um, copy and paste this, you know, kind of using the same approach as last time, okay? So because the objective is to change E10, which is uh, originally a non, which is a positive integer. So that means, you know, um, we want to eventually, we want to do this, okay? We want to be, be able to subtract one first, okay? Because if we can subtract one, that means we can reduce it by one. So if we can repeat that process, then eventually we can get the whole thing done, okay? So now we look at this and go like, hmm, if we subtract one from uh, the power of 10, it is the same thing as division by 10. So I have to make up for that by multiplying m by 10. So when I look at this m here, I would say, hmm, we can make up for that by changing that portion to m times 10. Because this multiplication by 10 is going to be canceled, up by, canceled by 10 to the power of something minus 1. So in the end, you know, v is still representing the same thing. So you look at this approach and go like, hey, this is great. We don't need to do division. Well, we don't need to do division for a while, okay? So what we want to do is to say, but what if we're dealing with a number like 1.23 times 10 to the power of, I don't know, let's try 50, okay? Well, that's, uh, that we can just keep doing it this way, right? You know, so we can basically say, oh, we will just have to multiply 1.23 by 10 to the power of 50, and then the power of 10 is going is getting down to zero, and we're all done. We don't even need to touch E2. What do you think is gonna be a problem knowing that M is an unsigned 64-bit integer? In other words, okay, in other words, what do you think is the problem of representing V like this? Okay, 10 to the power of 50 in this case. And then we have um, this thing, you know, subtract by 50. And because E10 is 50 to begin with, so 50 minus 50 is zero, we are all done. But remember, this part here has to be representable by a 64-bit integer. Okay, Dan was typing something. It's going to be huge. Exactly. Now, a 64-bit integer is huge too. What is the last, what is the, what is the, okay, you just have to be approximate, okay? What is the largest value that can be represented by a 64-bit integer? Okay, come on. You know, I just want to know as a base 10 number. What does 2 to the power of 64 minus 1 look like? Uh, 21? I think it's 18. It's actually 19. There are 19 digits to it. So it is approximately 1.8 times 10 to the power of 19, if I remember correctly. Um, but let's go ahead and do it. Do a quick check, okay? Because you know, I would like to teach you guys how to do a quick check on stuff like this. So, um, okay, I'm on the side. I'm here to, I'm ch just checking how to do approximation as a LaTeX symbol. And this won't take long because I can look at find this really quickly. All right, so approximately equal to. All right, this one doesn't have it. Yep, it does. Approx. Okay, there we go. Just it's just approx. Okay. So the, the the rule of thumb. Okay, instead of using the exact number, which you can find using a spreadsheet or a calculator, right? So instead of doing that, I would just go ahead and try to do everything by hand. Okay, and it is good to be able to do something by hand because you know it's not like you know you always have a calculator next to you, and it's good to understand you know the the basic idea of how to 
uh, approximate things. Okay, so the approximate approximation is one thousand. Okay, whoops, keep typing in the wrong window. So one thousand. Let's write one thousand as ten to the power of three is approximately uh, two to the power of ten. Okay. So this is the approximation that I'm going to use to estimate. Okay, you know how big is two to the power of eighteen. All right. So on the next line, we'll basically say two. Oops, two to the power of eighteen is exactly um, two to the power of ten. Wait, that's not right. Okay, it's not eighteen. It's sixty-four. Okay, there we go. Because we're dealing with sixty-four bit number, so it's two to the power of sixty-four. Okay, so two to the power of sixty-four is exactly two to the power of ten, and then that value to the power of six, uh, and then times two to the power of six. Oops, four. All right. So let me uh, close the dollar sign first because I want people to. Understand, you know that this is it, it. It makes sense, right? I mean, two to the power of sixty-four is two to the power of ten. That to the power of six. That would take care of two to the power of sixty. So we got four left. So to, with the four left, we multiply this value by two to the power of four. So now we go in here, and then we say, well, that's approximately sixteen. Oh, no, that is exactly sixteen times. Let's see. Sixteen times. Um, I'll rewrite it exactly the same way as before. Two to the power of ten. That whole thing to the power of six. Okay. Oops. I meant six. There we go. Come on. There we go. Six. There we go. So this is exact. But now we can throw in the approximation. So now we say、mm, this is approximately because you know, we did the approximation、uh, above over here. So this is approximately sixteen, which is I, which I kept times, and then we have ten to the power of three, and then that whole thing to the power of six. Okay. So now you can now look at this,、uh, the approximation, and then the approximation here is exactly sixteen. Followed by eighteen、uh, zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, that's、uh, that's a lot of zeros to work with. So I'm going to do a trick here. So I'll do a y.、Hmm. Trying to think of the the quickest way to do this. I think twelve y, and then come to here and then do a paste.、Uh. Not quite exactly what I want, but I can work with this. There we go. Okay. So is that working out okay? Does everybody kind of understand the the math behind all this? Okay, I'm looking at the text channel. All right, somewhat. Okay, what do you mean by somewhat? <laughs> all right. So let's 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 work on this math here. Okay. So two to the power of sixty four. Is exactly two to the power of, two to the power of ten. That to the power of six times two to the power of four. Is that okay? Does everybody understand why、uh, two to the power sixty four is exactly this value over here? Okay. Oh, okay. Cool. And then from here, I go to here just by you know expanding two to the power of four to sixteen and keep the other one. And then from here to here, I use the approximation symbol here because it is not exact. So the approximation is based on ten to the power of three is a, is about the same as two to the power of ten. One is one thousand, and the other one is one thousand twenty-four. Yeah, close enough, right? So that's there's the approximation, and exactly. So that is where I you know, switch from a power of two to what we are familiar with, which is power of ten. So now we have ten to the power of three, that to the power of six. So we have three times six many zeros. You know when it comes to a base ten number, the sixteen is outside. So that's why it is you know sixteen followed by eighteen zeros. Now that's not exact. It is a little bit lower than、uh, the exact value. The exact value is eighteen, and then some number you know with、uh, with、uh, 
the other、um, 18 digits. But for the most part, we can just look at it as 16 times 10 to the power of 18, or 1 point something times 10 to the power of 19. Regardless, okay, regardless of whether it's 1.6 times 10 to the power of 19 or 1.8 blah 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 times 10 to the power of 19. It is not going to be able to handle this, okay? Because we have ten to the power of fifty here. So I'm looking at the text channel here. <laughs> What is the purpose of that approximation value? The purpose is I don't need a calculator to know the order of magnitude, and I know without a calculator that this is way too much for a sixty-four bit number to handle. That is why, Doug. And I think it's really an important thing for you guys to have a grasp of order of magnitude without having to resort to a calculator, especially for stuff like this. Okay, you know, because I'm only concerned about the order of magnitude. I'm not even concerned about well, is it exactly the same? Am I off by one? You know, nope. I'm just looking at the ballpark and go like, nah, no way. We we cannot do it this way. And I think it is important for a computer science person, a developer, a programmer, you know, computer engineer, to be able to look, just take a glance at the number and understand the magnitude of the value without having to use a calculator. I, I think that is a very important thing to do.、Um, it does come with experience, okay, you know, but you know,、uh, it's it will take you longer if. Uh, there's no one showing you the techniques, you know. But if I show you the techniques, some of you will probably remember this at some point and go like, "Oh, okay." You know, Tech showed us a little trick to, you know, basically just quickly understand the order of magnitude of a particular value. Yes. So there is a value. There is a purpose of you know this little discussion here. All right. So moving on. So now we have a problem because、um, we can't do this, okay? You know, because、um, a 64-bit number cannot handle this. Then what are we gonna do? We really like this part, by the way, because we just we completely got rid of the、uh, power of 10. It's reduced to zero. We like that, but this part here, not so much, okay? So now the question is, what are we gonna do? Any ideas? So what we'll do, what we will do, is we are going to use this approach, okay, until it doesn't work anymore, okay. So what do I mean by we'll use this approach until it doesn't work anymore? So、um, I'm bringing this in because I want to show you how to use once again GDB to do some work like this, okay.、Um, Now, for this part of the discussion, I think it is important to use、um, a debugger or some kind of interactive engine that is guaranteed to handle、um, 64-bit math the way、uh, 64-bit math should be handled. Okay, so that's why this part is sort of important to do it in GDB because I know some people would say, "Well, we can do it in Python or Node or something like that." Um, I don't know about Python, but in Node,、uh, it doesn't really have an inherent 64-bit、um, integer representation. Python, as a slightly typed、uh, scripting language, may have the type of a 64-bit、oh, integer. I'm not 100% sure.、Um, but what we'll do is we're going to write a simple test program.、Uh, pound include stdint.h and int main. The idea is, I just need、um, int sixty four underscore t x x equals to zero return zero. Okay, kind of the same program that I showed、uh, maybe a week ago. Okay, and then gcc dash、uh, dash g dash o test test dot c. So this compiles the program gdb test. So now the program is. Over here, list the program, put a breakpoint on line eight, and we are done. Okay. Well, we are done as far as setting up the environment to explore what I mean by we'll keep using this approach until it doesn't work anymore. 
So I'm not going to show you the rest. Okay, I'm only going to show you what like, what we'll do uh, to the mantissa and how we know that the mantissa is. Guess what? You know this may be a little bit too much if we were to multiply by ten again. Okay, so we're going to use um, the value that we're dealing with here. So it's going to start with one hundred and twenty-three times 10 to the power of 48, okay? That's how the program parses the input because we want to represent everything as an unsigned 64-bit integer or otherwise some kind of integer value. So we are, we are gonna start with 123. So we say set var x equals to 123 and because GDB is, uh oh, that's like that. Oh, because I haven't run the program yet. There we go. Oh, okay. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Aiden. You can use C types in Python to use uh, C types. So can you designate exactly a width of 64 bits in Python? Does it have the equivalence of standard integer.h? I'm guessing it does, okay? You know, but I'm not familiar with Python, so I'm not going to say anything about it. But GDB works really well, okay? And you should have taken, you know, you, meaning the entire class, should have taken CISP360 already. So everything that I do here should be familiar to you. Okay. So we say set bar x equals to 123. And then what we do is we're going to say, well, what, how do we know that if we multiply x by 10 again, it's going to exceed what a 64-bit integer can represent? So that becomes the question, right? So let's go ahead and check and see what we can do um, to understand what is the largest value we can represent in uh, as a 64-bit unsigned integer. Um, and Aiden came up with a really cool way to do it. Okay, so we can do it like this. So we can say print um, u int 64 underscore t. I'm not sure whether the debugger knows this, the type depths. I'm guessing it does, but we'll see. Minus one. Yep, there we go. Whoa, hold on a second here, okay? Because um, I'm guessing not the entire class understands why if I print negative one and then cast it to a, in a unsigned 64-bit integer, they would print the actual largest value you can represent using 64 bits. I know some of you already know how you know, to do this because Aiden is the one who suggested this last time, okay? But, you know, um, I'm not going to assume the entire class understands this. It has to do with the binary representation of negative one and the binary representation of this number are exactly the same. So one is the signed representation, which means the most significant bit of one is representing, in this case, subtraction of two to the power of 63 whereas the other one is adding two to the power 63 to the whole thing. So indeed, this is the quick and, quickest and easiest way to get to the largest value um, of a 64-bit unsigned integer. So um, we can certainly do a comparison, right? So we can say, uh, let's compare x, which is 123 right now, uh, to, and see whether it is less than or equal to, um, the value that we are looking at here. So we'll say this is u in 64 underscore t minus one, okay? And if I want double or a lot of reassurance, I can put extra parentheses, and these are really not needed, but I just want to put in the extra parentheses to emphasize that we are now comparing x to the largest value in uh, as a 64-bit unsigned integer. And the answer is true. Well, I mean, guess what? You know, it's pretty obvious, right? We have 100 and something. Obviously, it's a whole lot less than 18 times 10 to the power of 18, okay? Okay. But now the question is, when do we know when to stop, okay? And by the way, oh God. do you think this expression will ever be false? I want you guys to think about this for a little bit, okay? Do you think this expression will ever be false? I can, I can hear the gear grinding in your head, okay? And Daniel is done with grinding, okay? Very good. Okay, Daniel is absolutely correct. There's no way 
the x can be greater than the uh, uh, negative one casted as a u in 64 underscore t. There's no way. Because guess what? This is already the largest value that x can contain. If this is already the largest value that x can contain, then x, whatever value that x as a variable has, cannot possibly be greater than this. Okay? So now the question is, if I keep multiplying x by 10, okay, you know, x uh, multiplied equals to 10, if I keep doing that, won't it eventually be greater than this side? The answer is no, because, you know, um, it just kind of wraps around, okay? If, if I try to store, you know, x times 10, and x times 10 is more than what a 64-bit unsigned integer can represent, it's going to truncate, okay? It's going to do a truncation and only store the least significant 64-bit of that product, which basically means the value, once again, will be less than or equal to this. So that is not, it's not going to work. <clears throat> what about this? Ah, now we're getting somewhere, right? Because now we are looking at x and say, hey, if x is indeed less than or equal to the largest value that we can represent as a 64-bit as a unsigned integer divided, divided by 10, if x is less than or equal to that, that means I got room to multiply x by 10 again. That is the trick, okay? This is the ticket for us to check whether uh, we can keep multiplying x by 10, okay? All right, so now we're going to do a loop here. No, we are not doing a loop in GDB. Instead, we are doing something that looks like a loop in GDB. So I multiply x by 10. I check this. I multiply by 10. I check this. I multiply to 10. I check this. I multiply by 10. I check this. So the worst, I mean, uh, you know, because we started off with 123, so that means we would be doing this for how many times? 17 times, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We got seven times now. Um, so we got 10 more times to go. And we'll go, I'll go ahead and speed up the process, okay? In other words, I'm going to do it like this. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Check it again. And I think that's one more time we can do this. And check again. Aha! Perfect. Okay. So now x is no longer less than or equal to the largest value you can represent in 64 bit as an unsigned integer divided by 10, which means if I multiply x by 10 again, it's going to be a value that we cannot represent uh, using a 64 bit integer. So now we are going like, okay, what are we going to do now? Because, you know, uh, the power of 10 that we are start that we are working with is actually 48. It's not 50, it's 48. This process will take care of 17 out of 48, which means we still got a whole bunch left. Okay, exactly. We got, what, 31 left. What are we going to do? We, we are already out of room in the 64-bit unsigned integer. So what we're going to do is we'll keep dividing x by 2 until there's enough room to multiply by 10 again. All right, so let's check out what is x at this point. Okay, not very surprising, right? It's, one, it's basically 1 1.23 times 10 to the power of 19 right now, okay? Which is the last value. If I multiply this value by 10 again, it's going to exceed the range that the 64-bit unsigned integer can represent. So at this point, I will check and go like, okay, I'm going to have to make room to uh, multiply multiply by 10 again, because that's what I want to do. Every time I can multiply the mantissa by 10, I'm reducing the exponent of 10 by 1. So I would like to do that, but I can't right now because there's no room to do it. So what I'll do is I'm, I'll do something like this. Instead of dividing by uh, multiplication by 10, I'm now going to go for division by two. It's like, uh, if I divide this by two, would I have enough room to have another multiplication by 10? Let's check, right? It's like, mm, no. 
Let's do it one more time. Is there enough room now? Nope. Let's do it one more time. Do we have enough room now? Aha. Okay. So now I can do another multiplication by ten. So x is now multiplied by ten again. And you know, now remember, every time we multiply something to x, we have to adjust one of the exponents. Every time we divide the mantissa by two, we also have to make an adjustment to one of the the exponents. I'm not going to tell you which one. Okay, you guys got to figure out that one. I'm just going to tell you that every time we do a multiplication or division to the mantissa, one of the exponents has to be adjusted. Okay, you guys have to decide which one. And how to adjust it? Okay, it's all written in the, in the module already. Okay, I'm just you know doing a quick you know live demonstration of the math involved here. So now I can do a multiplication by ten, and now I check you know the range again. It's like dope. Okay, we we just we just filled it up again. Okay, we we created enough room to for another multiplication by ten. Now it's not going to work. So now we have to divide by two again. Test. Nope. Test. Nope. Test. Nope. Uh, one more time. Test. Aha! There's enough room now. Now we can do another multiplication by ten. So, but hold on a second here. Every time we do a division, an integer division, we're going to introduce a bias error, right? So that means you know this is not quite as simple as this when we actually do the division, because we also have to factor in rounding, okay? Because we because if we are actually just doing this to the mantissa, then all of the errors, all of the uh, the digits that we lose track of, they are all making the result smaller than it should be. So we end up with a biased error. So you have to remember how we perform rounding. But without using the round function as a double. Okay, we talked about all of this in the previous class. You just have to make a uh, connection to those concepts in order to get this done. Okay, so I'm giving you little dots. Okay, on a piece of paper, and I'm expecting you guys to draw connections between the dots. Okay, that's kind of what you need to do. I put the dots on the paper, and you have to connect the dots. And Daniel is typing something. I'm gonna wait a little bit. <clears throat> All right. Why will there be an error in that division? Because well, not always, okay. But after a while, there will be, um, you know, it's going to be a problem. I can also tell you why you know, we can end up with an error too, because the mantissa can potentially be um, an odd number that is okay. Let me give you a number. Give you a, a, an example here. So let's just say that the value we are dealing with. Okay, I'm going to use uh, the whiteboard here. Okay, so let me pull this out of the window for now. <clears throat> On the side. All right, so. What if v is one point, and then we have to specify um, eighteen ones after this? Okay, so we can say eighteen p one. Ah, okay. That didn't work. I need a buy. So we need eighteen ones. Um, Aha. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out how to do this in VIs. I think it's 18 append one escape. There we go. All right, so what if this is the value that we are trying to convert to a double? So if this is the value being converted to a double, assuming that we have, um, uh, as a total, we have not eight, 19 uh, ones over here, so what's going to end up in the mantissa is basically all ones, uh, basically 19 ones in the 64-bit unsigned integer. And then the, the exponent of 10 is going to be uh, 50 minus 18. 
because we have 18 places after the decimal point. So that's going to be, what, 32? So now you end up with a, an odd number in the mantissa. So when you divide a odd number by two as an integer division, you're going to introduce an error because you know, the, the result is going to be um, 0.5 less than what it is supposed to be. So that is so. This is for illustrating, you know, what, uh, why we and why we can end up with uh, losing precision you know, when we divide it by two. Yep. So that there we go. Cool. All right. So I think I have already talked about everything you know that is related to your new lab. Okay. I know you have a lab that is due on next Tuesday, but this lab here. It's actually very closely related to that lab. If you can get the lab uh, started that we started on Tuesday done, uh, this one you know, won't take you nearly as much time to get it done because it shares a lot of the concepts. It is exactly the opposite of the other one. Okay. Well, I shouldn't say exactly the opposite, but it has uh, certain elements that are opposite to the other one. All right. So. I'm just going to wait a little bit here to see if there are any questions. If I don't see any questions, I will move on to the new topic. Yay, because we have been staying on this floating point number thing for a few days already. So it's time to move on to something new. So I'm going to wait a little bit longer because I have, according to YouTube, I got six people watching on the YouTube side. All right, Tom, Tom is typing something. Are we free to message on the weekend? Uh, <laughs> that is a, that's an interesting question um, because I can say, yes, you are free to message me. The question is, am I going to reply? The answer is, yeah, well, you know, if I get free time over the weekend and I see there are outstanding messages, I will respond over the weekend. Even though in the syllabus I said, you know, over the weekend, the turnaround time is 48 hours. But yes, I will answer messages over the weekend. But I cannot guarantee the turnaround time. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's all right. All right, so I'm guessing we don't have any further questions at this point related to converting a, a base 10 scientific notation as a string into a double, preci double precision floating point number at least as described in the homework assignment. Okay, the homework assignment doesn't do the entire conversion, but it will get us to the point where the rest of the conversion is like easy peasy. Okay, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay with you know, getting most of the difficult work done and just leaving you know, some of the really easy work to be done later. Okay, so now we're gonna move on. All right, so we are moving on to Okay, let me check. We are moving on to the von Neumann architecture, which is the one topic that we have, which is the one uh, module container before we move on to actual assembly language programming, which is down here. All right, so the first thing is, now I'm hoping, you know, some of you, you know, when you're reading this, the name of this particular module container is automatically asking, uh, why is it named Von Neumann? I mean, why is it named Von Neumann? Does anyone want to know? And Aiden probably knows the answer already. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, famous person. Very interesting person too. So, you know, as you already know, this is what I would do, right? You know, I cannot just say, okay, some guy you know, named Von Neumann did something, blah, 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 okay? I'm going to look it up. And this guy is Join Von Neumann, okay? And this is a good time to tell you guys what is the, the word of rotating today. I'm going to type it in the text channel. It is that. <laughs> Johnny, yes. You can use a uppercase or a lowercase j, okay, because I, I would consider both as correct answers. You know, uh, this guy looks a little bit like uh, the actor who played uh, Mycroft in Sherlock. 
probably not as tall, okay, but it looks a little bit like him. Hmm, interesting. Anyway, uh, John von Neumann is a very interesting person, uh, not for the same reason that Einstein is famous and you know interesting because he discovered um, relativity and you know contributed to physics in a major way. John von Neumann contributed to not only physics, but also to many other fields in math and engineering. Just take a look at this. Von Neumann made major contributions to many fields, including, which means this list may not be uh, exhaustive, mathematics. And within mathematics, you know, they also broke it down into multiple disciplines, okay? Foundations of mathematics, functional analysis, ergo ergotic, theory, representation theory, operator, algebras, ge geometry, topology, and numerical analysis, and then physics. And then under physics, okay, there's quantum mechanics, hydrodynamics, and quantum statistical mechanics, economics, game theory, and then computing. And within computing, it has the, the architecture that is named after him, linear programming, okay? If you uh, study linear algebra, you know, I think your professor may touch on linear programming, which is an optimization technique, self-replicating machines, and this is way before Stargate SG-1. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the guys thought about all of these things way before his time. Uh, stochastic computing, which means it is not deterministic, um, and statistics, that is a long list. Now, somebody can just kind of dabble in each field a little bit, know something about it, and say, yeah, I'm a jack of all trade. He's not a jack of all trade either, because if you ask anyone, you know, any famous person in any one of these fields and ask, what do you think of John von Neumann, you know, back in his time, that person is going to say, he's a genius. He's a genius in my field. And everybody is going to say that. He is that good. Okay. Unfortunately, the guy passed away relatively young. So he passed away when he was mm, younger than 54. So he was 53 something, you know, when he passed away. And that is really unfortunate because if he had, if he were to live longer, I think he would end up with more contribution to, um, you know, many different fields. And the reason, at least some people thought, you know, the, the reason why he passed away you know, with cancer early on had to do with uh, experimentation of hydrogen bombs. You know, he was one of the principal scientists behind the, um, the creation of hydrogen bombs. So that is the guy, okay? This is the person. I mean, obviously, this is a really long page. For those of you who are interested, you can read a little bit more, okay? So now the question is, what exactly is a von Neumann architecture? Well, the answer is, well, maybe we should look at what is a non-von Neumann architecture. Now, that is kind of interesting name, right? You know, non-von Neumann architecture. So as it turns out, before, not, before uh, von Neumann architecture, computers were programmable. But the way you program a computer is not nearly the same as how you reprogram a computer today. So let me show you a picture of a um, programmable computer, but it is already considered super archaic by today's standard. And I'm gonna do a little bit of search on the side that you cannot see uh, because I cannot remember the name of that computer. <laughs> um, early 8-bit computers. Okay, so let me just look it up. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so we got notable computers. And I'm looking for the name of that computer. This is before the Apple II computer, by the way. Nope, that doesn't tell me anything. It is a computer kit. Okay, so we'll look for kit two.
Okay, list of early microcomputers. That probably will have it. Now, I think it is important for me to look this up, you know, because some people may say, but you're wasting time. No, because I think if I give you, oh, there we go. It's the Altair 8800. Okay, so let's look it up. It's the Altair 8800. And this is a great picture of that. Okay. And I want to look at the front panel to be specific. There we go. All right, so this is the this is the front panel of this computer. And this is how this is the interface to, that you're going to use to program this computer. They look at they can, you look at this and go like, well, this looks like a PC. You know, I bet you there are USB ports in the back of the computer, or maybe it's Bluetooth enabled. I can just hook up a Bluetooth mouse, a Bluetooth you know, uh, you know keyboard, and um, maybe it would just kind of stream the output to a TV, and that's it. I mean, that's a Raspberry Pi can do all that, right? No, no, this is it. There's nothing to the back of this computer. This is the entire interface that you use to interact with this computer. So let's go ahead and take a closer look. Yay. OK, see all of these A thing, OK, these LEDs, A0 all the way up to A15 up down here, and all the Ds, you know, uh, that is, they are labeled Z0 all the way up to D7. The D are the data bits and the A are the address bits. In other words, you can, uh, you can, okay, you can use the LEDs to tell you which address you're looking at in memory and what is the data corresponding to that address. That is how it can show the content of memory, one byte at a time, okay? So now the question is, okay, that's just you know, how we know what is inside the computer. How do we program the computer? All right, so let's take a look at this little toggle switch here. They are very mechanical. I mean, this is one of those computers where you know everything is so tactile. You know, it will make people you know who like sensory stuff very very happy. Um, so you see this switch here. You know, it goes you know data versus address. So. And it has a neutral position too, I think. So this is how you control which address you want to look at. Um, I'm just making an assumption here. You're flipping up is a one, flipping down is a zero. So you basically flip 16 of these switches to let the computer know which location you want to look at. And then you flip another switch. Let me see which one is it. Uh, um, Okay, then you flip another switch to uh, so that the data would be displayed, or you switch another you, you flip another switch so they can now specify the the data that goes into that location. And for convenience purposes, you can see down here with the toggles, uh, there is a next somewhere. I thought I saw that. Examine next, deposit next. So deposit is store, okay? So it will basically store the date, the eight bits that you have specified to the 16-bit address that you have specified. So that's deposit. And then deposit next, I'm going to assume, is you can store the next, you can store the data to the next available location. So you don't have to flip, you know, a whole bunch of switches again. <laughs> Aiden is correct. You can probably t specify um, a you know ten locations you know per hour, and if you make a mistake, there's no GDB, there's no debugger. The program simply is not going to run the way you expect it to run. Okay, uh, Christy is asking, how did they keep track of everything? Well, let's just say that early day you know, programmers have a whole lot more mental capacity than we do. <laughs> they need to have that kind of mental capacity. We don't need that, that kind of mental capacity. Are we kidding? I mean, if you use any type of IDE, if you use um, VS Code, for instance, um, I mean, the IDE will tell you ahead of time, it's like, mm, I think that is wrong. And then you can even ask the IDE, uh, so what do you think I should put here? 
<laughs> you can you can type you know the name of a variable you know in a strongly typed language, put the you know, and type the dot, and then he would list everything that you can do at that point. It's like okay, these are all the members corresponding to this particular object. Which one would you like? You pick a function, you pick a method, and they will tell you how many parameters are expected. And if there's documentation in the um, in the method, it will even describe each one for you. So, so it's a whole different kind of story. All right, but this is a von Neumann architecture because you can store the program in memory. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, Daniel. So imagine um, this is already a von Neumann architecture. Now, what makes it a von Neumann von Neumann architecture is that the program is stored. In memory. Now, to you guys, okay, the concept of what do you mean by the the program is stored in memory? Of course, it is stored in memory. Where else would I store the program? Uh huh. That is why the von Neumann architecture. That's why Johnny has made such a great contribution because today we don't even question, you know, how to program a computer if we do not store a program in the memory. So if you dial back even further, okay, let me just go try to find a picture and do, I'm doing the search on the sides just so that it's not uh, uh, distracting to you guys. But I'm looking for wire wrap computer programming. There we go. And let's see if I can find some images of some really, really old computers. Some of these is not really old. Um, but I, I think for purposes of this discussion, they are, this one is usable. Okay. So I'm going to copy and paste the link over here. There we go. And it's this one. And the picture that I was looking at was, there we go. This. Is how you program a computer. You literally change the wiring of how components are connected to reprogram an early day computer. And I'm not kidding. This is pre von Neumann computer programming. Um, oh, okay. Let me go address the Aiden's question because that's an interesting one. Uh, the Harford architecture is uh, is 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 basically is an enhancement on top of the von Neumann architecture. In the Harford architecture, um, the there are two memory spaces that are entirely separated. One memory space is only for code for the program you know, for the program of a uh, in the computer, and then the other space is data only. And by doing this, you know, having one memory uh, um, device only responsible to supply the opcode and the other one only to contain the data that's being processed. Now you have two buses going into the processor, which means you, know, you don't have a bus contention anymore because otherwise you have you know, what we call bus contention, which basically means uh, we are going through the same uh, connection to get the instruction, but also to get the data to be processed, and as a result, you know, the the, the uh, uh, for normal von Neumann architecture, the memory bus is always busy; is always the bottleneck. But in the Harford architecture, it is not as bad because you know you are grabbing instruction from a memory space that is entirely separated from the data space, so they can they can occur at the same time. So you can basically do a lot of stuff to streamline the execution of an instruction. And even for an 8-bit processor, okay, and a Harvard architecture makes a huge difference in terms of you know, what kind of pipelining optimization you can do. Um, and for those of you who are, you know, even who are more interested in the Harvard architecture, a fairly modern and well-used architecture that is uh, a Harvard architecture is the AVR architecture. So you can you can look up AVR. Um, it is also used in Arduino's. Uh, so Arduino. Uh, um, so if you just look up these two words, uh, you will find you know Arduino uh, and how it is using the AVR um, processor. 
the AVR processor line are Harvard architectures. So they have a distinct, you know, flash memory space for program code and a um, RAM space for variables, the stack, and so on. And that's why, you know, they can achieve a very high throughput, you know, when it comes to a, a relatively simple processor. Um, these things, you know, the AVR processors, um, the more complicated, you know, more powerful ones, you know, but still 8-bit, I think they're about 10 to 12 bucks each when you buy individual ones. But when you're looking at the low-end ones, they can be sub-dollar, um, easily quite a bit sub-dollar, you know, when you buy in large quantities. Um, so the Harvard architecture is very interesting, but it is basically an enhancement on top of von Neumann architecture. You know, von Neumann architecture, there's only one memory space for both code and data. In a Harvard architecture, there are two entirely separated spaces, one for code and one for data. So I hope this kind of helps to explain what is a Harvard architecture for those who are interested. As far as we are concerned, we just need to know what is a von Neumann architecture. But you know, if you also have encountered the term of Harvard architecture, now you get an idea of what it is. Cool. All right. So, so uh, are we still having questions about the contribution of John von Neumann and why we name an architecture after his his last name? No. Okay. Because without him, there won't be any um, over air over the OTA. Is it all over the air? You know, update of your flash ROM. You know, updating your apps and whatnot. There's nothing like that. Every time you want to update something, open up the computer and be prepared to disconnect hundreds, thousands, millions of little wires and then reconnect them in the proper way. And if you don't reconnect in the proper way, your computer may burn up. It may just simply not work. We don't know what's going to work. We don't know what's going to happen. That is his contribution. Thanks to John von Neumann, we can update programs just like that. Cool. Yeah. Yep. So if you look into the history of computer science, you will find out that there are many, many people, really smart people along the way that makes it possible to get to where we are now. Um, and that's only what? From the end of World War II, let's say it's, uh, let's, let's just count it as 1950. Um, we're only looking at 70 years. Yep, we're only looking at 70 years. If you look into automotive technology, you know, the internal combustion engine, over 70 years, we made quite a bit of process, progress, right? You know, we, we have, you know, engines getting a little bit more efficient. Jet engines, okay, which were invented, you know, during World War II, is now fairly commonplace, okay? But there's nothing, no technology advanced during a time of 50, 70 years nearly as much as um, semiconductors and computers. You know, because Moore's Law says, you know, doubling every 18 months. So that's a lot of 18 months, you know, in 70 years. Cool. All right. So now getting back to the boring stuff, right? You know, we cannot just talk about all the fun stuff. Got to go back to the boring stuff once in a while. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm as, as bumped as you are when we need to get back to the more boring stuff. This is not even for this class. Okay, so I'm just going to have to look. Where did I put that tab? <clears throat> there we go. All right, so getting back to here. So the first thing we need to do is to talk about um, how do we store something, you know, in a computer? You know, what, what does the memory look like from the perspective of uh, transistors, okay, or logic gates, okay, so we, we can we can stay with logic gates. So let's take a look. Cool. <clears throat> I think this is all really cool stuff. So the first thing we look at is a SR latch, okay. An SR latch is the most basic um, circuitry that is capable of quote-unquote remembering something. Okay, 
is called an SR latch, and the term SR will be clear why it's called SR latch. Okay, and the way I describe it is not graphical. Okay, and and I chose to use an object-oriented method to uh you know to describe a circuit. So uh, if you already know you know C plus you know that oh okay NAND two is probably the name of a class because it is starting with an uppercase, and N one and N two are variables or slash objects of that class. S and R are input pins. Q and N Q are output pins. Um, and then you know the circuit is probably some kind of a global variable or a variable and object that is already existing at the time. And this is a method called add node, and we are adding a new node. And in that node, we are specifying you know pin of S and um, the first in of N one. Okay, so this is a non-graphical way to describe a circuit. Okay, so let me write this circuit or describe. Uh, let me construct this circuit on the side using LogiSim. So now we can actually look at you know how we describe something that is inherently graphical using text, and then we'll go back and talk about why do we want to do it this way. Because LogiSim is so graphical and so intuitive, you know why are we using you know going back to text, you know which is not so cool. All right, so NAND two, so we go to gates, pick up a NAND gate, N A N D. There we go. Uh, we switch the number of inputs to two, and change the size to narrow. And since we need two of these, might as well just duplicate it at this point. And you can basically label one as N one, and then label the other the other one as N two. Now the label of a particular component in LogiSim has no significance other than how it is displayed.、Uh, we have two input pins.、Uh, one is called N one, and the other one, oops, nope, S and R. Okay, sorry about that. This is S, and then we duplicate it. This is going to be R. There we go. We got two output pins. Okay, so we pull one output pin over here, and one is called Q, and the other one is N Q, which is basically not Q. And if you watch、uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation, you will probably get a kind of caca out of this, because there's an entire、um, race of people. They call themselves the Q Continuum. Okay, super arrogant aliens, you know, thinking they are so smart, and for everybody else, they are NQs. They are not Qs. So,、uh, Star Trek references irrelevant to this class, just for fun. Anyway, so now we got all the components. We got six components. So a node in a circuitry is basically、um, a collection of wires that electrically are connected together. Okay, so let me say that one more time. A node is a collection of copper wires on the circuit board that are electrically connected. Okay, so now, so in in other words, they are basically just regular wires in LogiSim that connect a pin or a port of one component to the port of another component. So let me just kind of line things up a little bit because you know there if there ah、uh, there we go. And I just want to see whether it looks good on your screen. So it looks okay. All right. So we just move this one down a little bit. There we go. So N one. So according to this, the first input, okay, because it has an index of zero. So the first input of N one connects to the only pin of pin,、uh, of the input pin S, which is this one here. So I can line up everything so that it looks nice, right? So the, this goes here, and then we look at、uh, the second line of adding a node. We are connecting the second input of N two. Okay, so once again, line up everything to、um, R, the pin of R. So the, now we got those two connected, and then we look at the next two lines. N one's output, which is this connection point here. Connects to N two's first input, 
So this is where things go. Hmm, it is starting to get a little bit interesting because the output of one becomes the input of the other. Okay, but let's finish you know, n one first because the output of n one also also goes to the only pin of Q, which is this connection point. So let's go ahead and connect those two. So you can see sometimes a node only connects two ports of two components, and sometimes, but it is not limited to only to two. You can be, you can have three things, four things, and so on. Okay. So this particular uh, node connects three things together: the output of N one, Q, which is an output pin, and the input to N two. So the other one, I'm looking at the last line now. The output of N two goes to the second input of N one. Okay, so this crisscrosses a little bit. Go back to here, and then the output also goes to here. There we go. Hmm, it's not a very complicated circuit, is it? It only makes use of two NAND gates, and you know, I think a the implementation of OR takes more than two NAND gates already, so this is not a complicated circuit to begin with. Uh, it would use up what eight transistors because we need four transistors for each NAND two gate. So since it has two NAND gates, now we need eight transistors, and yet it has an effect of "quote unquote" remembering something. So what I'll do now is I'm going to make you guys think. Even though logism is more than capable of showing you the behavior of this circuit, I want you guys to think about it. So I'm going to turn off simulation, and I'm going to reset simulation so that we don't see any values, you know, any、uh, wires. Okay, and we'll just have to do this the hard way, the manual way. All right. So I'm going to say, what if S is zero? And so is R. What do you think is going to be the output at Q, and also not Q? So let's let's think about this. So how do you think about the propagation of the input, and then try to figure out the output? Well, we just follow the pins, right? So we look at this zero, and we follow where it's going to go. Oh, it's going into N one. So now we look at N one and go like, hmm, darn it, N one has another input, which is a little bit difficult to, to figure out. But wait, hold on a second here. N one is a NAND gate, right? So what happens if at least one input of a NAND gate is a zero? I want you guys to think about it. A NAND gate is a negated AND gate, right? So what happens with a regular AND gate when at least one input Is a zero. Can we determine the output just by looking at one single input of zero? Come on, you guys know the answer. It's a zero. Okay, so Quan is correct. So the output of a regular AND gate is going to be a zero. But since this is a NAND gate, there's a negating part of of the output. So that means the output is going to be A one. Oh, okay, cool. And so is this output, right? Because when you look at the circuitry, the upper half and the lower half are symmetrical. So we can now say that okay, if S and R are both zeros, then the output would be both ones at Q and also N Q. Is that part okay? Is this analysis okay? All right, so I'm gonna assume that you guys are okay with the discussion up to this point. Yes. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so now we're gonna move on, and then we say, "Hmm, we're gonna change one of these inputs." Okay. So we are now in this particular state. Okay. But we're gonna change one of these two to a one. It doesn't matter which one I choose to change because you know the、uh, because the circuitry is. Um, up down, you know, sym symmetric. So I can just change one of these, and you know,、uh, that that will work out for the、uh, other variation too. 
So I'm just going to say, hmm, we're going to change this one to a one and see what happens, right? So when we change this to a one, okay, um, remember NQ is opening a one, two. So this is a one and this is now a one. So now we have both of these inputs being ones. What do you think is going to be out to be the output of this NAND gate? Tom is typing something. It's going to be a zero. Yes, very good. Okay, so that means this is going to be a zero. Okay, so we'll go ahead and change this to a zero now. There we go. And of course, the next question is, but isn't this zero going to affect the output of N2? Well, no, the answer is no, because um, R is still a zero at this point. So we have zero going in, and then we have zero going in, but we only need one of the inputs to be a zero to guarantee an output of a one for an N2 gate. So it's okay, okay? You know, N1 changing its output from a one to a zero has no impact to N2 because the other input of N2 is still a zero at this point, okay? Don't we do something similar to this before? I don't think so. I don't think we have looked at a circuit where uh, the output goes back to the input. All right, so here comes the next question. The next question is, what if I change uh, R from a zero to a one? Let's find out, okay? So everything else being the same, now I change this zero to a one. Is it going to cause any additional changes? That's the question. So we look at this one and go, okay, it goes straight into N2. So the first thing that might change the output is going to be N2. But when we look at N2, mm, the other input of N2 is coming in from the output of N1, which is still a zero at this point. So N2 still has at least one of its inputs being a zero, which means N2 will continue to output a one. Okay, what do you mean by zero, Dawood? N2 continues to output a one because N1 is still outputting a zero. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> Okay, so this is this is one transition. Okay, so you might want to remember this. Um, you know what? This is this. I like teaching online because I can do this. Because I can take a screenshot like this and paste it in the text channel as my short-term memory. There we go. Mm, okay. Why did I do this? because I'm going to flip all of these input bits back to zeros. Let me see whether I can have a multi-level undo in Logisim. So we'll go, nope, there's no undo in Logisim. <laughs> Control Z doesn't work. <laughs> all right, fine, we'll do it the hard way. Well, harder way, it's not really that bad. It's just harder, not really terrible, okay. And of course, I have to land my cursor at the right place to get to change these things back. Okay. All right. So now we are back to the, the first configuration. Okay. And now we go like, hmm, we're going to change one of these bits, you know, from a zero to a one. And we're going to change the other one. And I, obviously, I cannot remember which one I changed um, to begin with. Uh, let me see. Uh, I think last time I changed uh, the S to a to a one first. Okay, thank you, Daniel. So this time I'm going to change the bottom one. All right. So we'll go ahead and change the bottom one to a one. Okay. And now we we analyze what is the effect of this change. So when we look at the effect of this change, we have to first follow the first thing that got changed. Okay. So this is how you analyze the propagation of a change is really just to follow what is changed at this point and then see how you can propagate that change. 
a flipped effect is correct, Tom. But I still want to kind of manually go through this just so that we know the process. So we look at this one, goes into this N2. And this one is still going to this N2. So the output of this N2 is now going to be changed to a zero because both of the inputs of N2, which is a NAND gate, are now ones. So the output of this NAND gate is going to be a zero. So now we look at this change, the output of N2 is changed. So we now want to look at, is that going to change, do any further changes? So we follow this output and go like, hmm, it's going back into this N1. But since N1 still has one of these inputs being a zero, so it will continue to output a one. So N1 is not changing its output despite one of its inputs is getting changed. So this is the picture when I switch R from a zero to a one. And now I ask, what if I change your know, S from a zero to a one? Okay, that's my change. So now we follow the change again, because this Y is the first one that got changed. So I have to analyze N1 and see if N1 is going to change its output. So this is a one. And then we look at this wire, it is still a zero. N2 is outputting a zero at this point. So at least one of the inputs of N1 is a zero. And as a NAND gate, it continues to output a one. So there are no further changes that is possible because um, N1 as a component is the one that, see, that, that would see a change of its inputs, but it's not changing its output. So there's no further propagation that we need to analyze. So we look at this picture and go like, uh, okay, fine, what is so special about this, right? Okay, take a snapshot and paste it into the text channel. Okay, so now we look at the text channel in Discord and we look at the two pictures, go like, that doesn't look right. That just doesn't look right. Because they, in, in both of the pictures, we have inputs of ones, and yet the outputs are opposite. You know, in those, you know, in those two configurations. The input configurations are exactly the same, but somehow the output configurations are different. Is everybody following me? You know, following, you know, that, you know, for the same input, the circuitry can have different output states. It is not crazy. This is memory. This is how, at the lowest level of your computer, this is how it remembers something, okay? So as it turns out, you know, the, S, the name of S R latch, S is set and R is reset. So one is responsible. Um, so for the most part, we only care about uh, output Q, okay? So most of the time we don't even care about NQ, but sometimes we do. So, you know, just so for, for all our discussions, it'll look at Q, okay? So when S becomes a zero, it is basically saying set the output Q to a one. When R is a zero, it is basically saying reset uh, output Q to a zero, okay? So we have one, okay, it's kind of imagine that you have two push buttons, okay? If you press on one push button, it will change the output to a one. If you push the other button, it will clear the output to a zero. Okay, and then when you release the buttons, okay, it will remember the state. That is the memory effect of an SR latch. <clears throat> no, that is not why SSD is faster. SSD is faster only because it is a solid state device and has no moving parts in it. Uh, and then Daniel is commenting, it is like locking repeaters in Minecraft. I'm pretty sure you can do something like this in Minecraft, although I'm not 100% sure what is a locking repeater. Um, well, obviously, I'm not playing Minecraft enough. I can ask my son about it. <laughs> um, but this is the lowest level of memory devices in a, in a computer, okay? It is called an SR latch. Now, it is, it's really kind of cool. So just kind of remember the mental picture. Um, S is a button, R is a button. If you push this button, you are setting the output to a one. 
if you push this button and then release it, you're resetting the output to a zero. Okay. Uh oh, darn it. Always at the last moment. So okay, I'm back. You know, uh, you know, Discord is crashing at the very last moment, and it's not the first time either, is it? So let's go ahead and share the screen again. There we go. All right. So Discord just crashed on me. Let me reshare my OBS screen. So those for those of you who are watching the YouTube, you know, you, you you're not seeing any interruption. Uh, but if you're on Discord, unfortunately, you know, uh, there was just a little blackout. We call this technical difficulty. Anyway, okay. Anyway, so just to repeat what I said earlier, imagine S and R as two what we call momentary switches, which means you know when you release you know, the 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 button will pop up, pop up pop out again. So if you press the button S, okay. It's going to change the output from whatever it was to a one. Now, if if it was a one already, it would just maintain it. If you push the button R, it's going to reset the output. And when I say the output, I'm only referring to Q. It will reset the output to a zero. Okay. So if you press the S switch twice, it doesn't do a single thing. That is correct, Tom. But the tricky one, okay, I'm running out of time, but this is a, you know, this is a, a good thing for you guys to think over the weekend. And I'll talk about this on next Tuesday. So the question is, what if I change both of the inputs to zeros and then change both zeros to ones at exactly the same moment? What is this circuitry going to do? Okay. So let me just repeat what I said. Okay. I am going to change both inputs to zeros first. Okay. So I'm going to change this to a zero and change this to a zero. And then at exactly this, oops, uh, come on, change this to a zero. And at exactly the same time, I will change both inputs, oops, to ones. Ah, come on. I have to remember to press the enter key to, for it to remember that. There we go. So, so now the question is, what if I do both at the same time? I change both inputs from zeros to ones at exactly the same time. And Daniel says, die. No, no, it's actually quite lively. It's quite the opposite of die. It's going to dance. <laughs> it's going to dance. So I will let you guys think about this. Okay. You know, just remember how I analyzed the propagation of changes. So the one thing you have to remember is it takes time. There's, there's a certain amount of time between the change of the input and the update of the output. So every gate has intrinsic to it a propagational delay. Now, we first encountered the term of propagational delay when we talked about carry look ahead, okay? But it applies here as well. So when you try to analyze the circuit, especially when we change both inputs from zeros to ones, you have to remember when M1 sees its inputs changing state, it will take a certain amount of time to update its output. The same applies to N2 because without understanding that then Daniel would be correct. Okay, so Daniel is right. It is a paradox if there's no propagational delay. But because there is propagational delay, it is no longer a paradox. Okay, the circuitry will behave in a certain way and it is not going to die. Okay, in fact, it will become quite lively because you will say, all I did is to change the inputs to, you know, to ones from zeros and the circuit is doing this, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And it's going to be interesting to see what it's going to do. All right. So Andrew types, 
Oh, okay. So let, let me just go back to Daniel's question in the text channel. Are we assuming both outputs are zeros? No, no. <laughs> I want you to describe what the outputs are going to do when we change both inputs from zeros to ones at the same time. And then Andrew typed, you see the same thing in Minecraft. The redstone is has a bloody stroke. <laughs> no, it just has a pulse rate of going way up. Yes. But I think you can probably do this in Minecraft, okay? If you know how to use the redstone, um, you'll first create the NAND gates, okay? And then, you know, uh, and then simulate what we what I just described. And you will see the redstone doing some really funky stuff, you know, if the redstone is truly emulating this particular circuit. And the nice thing about Minecraft is the redstones are not instantaneous devices. In other words, there's definitely a propagational delay. And because of that, it slows down everything for you to visually see what this circuit is going to do. In fact, you might be able to see this in, in some people may have done it already on YouTube and have it captured. So if you go to YouTube and just search for SR Latch Redstone Minecraft um, and uh, oscillation, okay, that's the word that you want to use, you might be able to find it already. If not, I would suggest that some one of you do that and push it onto YouTube because it's really kind of fun. All right, so we are out of time, and there's nothing else for me to talk about in terms of in, in as far as the lecture is concerned. You do have this new lab, and I strongly suggest you get started with this as early as possible. Um, I will be back in about 10 minutes to look at the text channel to see if there are any questions, and I will answer questions as I can over the weekend. No guarantee of turning around time, but I will uh, answer as I have time. So um, I'm going to say bye now and have a nice weekend. I'll see you guys on next Tuesday. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So go have dinner, go, you know, eat something and, you know, try to get started with the programming assignments early. And don't forget to spend some time to analyze this circuit and also read ahead of me. Yes, it, there's a lot of stuff to do over a long weekend. Yep, yep, everybody have a nice weekend. And I'm going to sign off from the voice channel now.